Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Welcome everyone back to our last webinar of the year. This will be five ways to a safe workstation for electrical safety testing. Um, we'll be covering a couple um, OSHA standards and just uh, better ways to keep your operators safe. Um, before we begin, let's meet our team. Uh, let me present introduce myself. I'm Anthony. I'll be your presenter today. Applications engineer here with Associated Research. Um, as a panelist today, we have our lead applications engineer, Syed Abidi. He will be answering any questions that will arise during the presentation. We have our Q&A uh, feature on the webinar, so feel free to ask questions through there, and he will answer back through that feature as well if he feels any of the questions are pertinent to the presentation and all users find help, oh, he'll be uh, breaking in occasionally to let us know. Also our organizer um, is Alice Noble, marketing coordinator here at Associated Research. Um, she can get anyone set up if they're having any difficulties with audio or visual. Um, again, reiterating, please use the Q&A utility to ask any questions concerning our material. Syed will get everyone's, answered, everyone's questions answered. Um, as always, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to download or Allison can email you a copy um, within a couple days. Also, all our webinars are on YouTube. Um, our YouTube channel is ARHYPOT, that's one word, A-R-H-Y-P-O-T, where you can kind of view an archive of all our webinars, quick start videos, and a lot of useful, more useful information to help you uh, familiarize yourself with the instruments. Um, below is Allison's email, again, if you would like a copy of the presentation. Um, a few moments, just in case there's any issues. If not, we can begin. So let's look at the learning objectives for our presentation today, right? We're going to begin with the basics of safety. So what are shock hazards? It's important to be able to identify in your workstation where most of you are high potting, you know, where do the shock hazards lie? And um, on top of that, we'll talk about the effects of current on the human body, you know, how much is too much, uh, when do we start perceiving it. Then we'll move on to 10 things a qualified operator should know. Um, it falls, the responsibility falls on the employer to train, you know, an operator and make sure they're aware of hazards and how to deal with them. Next, we'll move on to their actual workstations, stations with positive protection and stations uh, without positive protections. And we'll feature some of our uh, personal protective equipment and some training resources at the end. So let's get started with potential shock hazards. There's a few routes that current can take through our body right, for us to get shocked. Um, on the left, you can see the operator is making contact with either a DUT or some sort of current carrying live part um, on your test station. And if he is standing on earth ground or you know not isolated from ground, that current will flow um, from his arm and return to ground, um, shocking your user. Okay, that's kind of the most well, I guess it's tough to say most common, but that's um, most likely how most people get shocked. You know, they're they're kind of a, an open circuit, always on ground, and then completing that circuit by touching a live part, you get shocked. Another very common way is contact made with two points of your body, right? Completing the circuit through... Um, so let's say you are isolated. Let's say you're standing on an isolation mat, which is you know great to have at workstations. But if you allow both of your arms to touch that live circuit, now you've just created a new path uh, to go through you through your uh, chest cavity, which is probably the most dangerous route that current can take, um, which can cause um, fibrillation and um, other severe. Uh, health risk. There's there's a couple types of electrical burns. You know, I think the NEC labels three as there's an electrical burn, which is just for an electrical burn to occur, current needs to flow through the human body. And then we have um, an arc burn, where an arc burn is 
from uh, the temperature that was produced by arcing when uh, you know you get close to a high potential or you make contact with high potential and then you just have your contact burns which is kind of touching uh, an overheated electrical device okay so <clears throat> this is what causes the severity of electrical shock right what is it influenced by so it's different for every person you know the same amount of current through two people doesn't mean the same uh, damage to the person, the same health risk. So the physical condition and response um, is, is a factor that influences the severity of shock. The path, as we discussed earlier, you know, is it going from your arm down through your leg back to ground, or is it which, you know, could cause severe burn, but still kind of bypassing your heart so you're not um, affecting the beat of your heart and um, other um, you know things inside you that need certain certain pulses to work um, the duration or length of time the person is exposed to obviously the longer you're exposed to that current um, the more damage you uh, will receive the, m the more harm you will receive now ideally you know if you're using an associated research instrument and um, through some sort of uh, misoperation uh, current is not returning to our transformer and your operator is being shocked, um, that's when our smart GFI kicks in. Um, and uh, a lot of standards, especially um, OSHA standards, um, call for a GFCI in your input power as well. Um, so that's something that can limit the duration of length, the, the duration or length of time the person is exposed to that current. Um, the magnitude of voltage and current flow, this is something major when it comes to high pot testing because most of us um, are using our high pot instruments to test uh, we're creating a potential difference of you know in the thousands of voltage um, now while our instruments can not produce a lot of current still being exposed to that type of poten potential difference across the impedance of our body can cause major damage um, and then the frequency as well right um, of the supply voltage so these are uh, the elements of what influences the severity of shock and um, what values can we take, right? So here's the effects of electrical current on the body. Um, if you've seen some of our webinars in the past, I know you've probably become familiar with this table, but it's really important to, to kind of mem to memorize or just understand the values of current that start um, giving us specific reactions to it. So anything less than a, a half a milliamp, we're probably not going to perceive. You know, we do LL, uh, LCT testing, right? Leakage current testing on, uh, you know, in medical device industry, it's, it's, it's a huge test that's required. And, you know, everything has a certain amount of leakage. You know, it, it might be in the microamp range. You know, your, your PC or um, any other device you touch, there's probably, you know, a small amount of uh, microamp leakage, but we just don't perceive it, you know, and we don't need to worry about it. It doesn't affect our body. Um, the protection of our skin, you know, it, it's our insulator. It protects us from it. But anything, once you get past that half a milliamp to one milliamp range, that's when you start perceiving it. That's when you kind of can, it almost feels like a vibration or a buzz. Something's going on, you know, it's not hurting you but you can tell something's going on. Uh, once we get to that past the milliamp, near five milliamp range, this is when you can start feeling a slight shock or a startled reaction, um, especially in this range can be dangerous because startled reaction, uh, you know, like someone on a ladder or someone near other live parts reacting and coming into contact or falling can create a dangerous situation. Now, once we're in the 6 to 30 milliamp range, um, this is where you start losing control of uh, your uh, muscle functions. You know, painful shock, inability to let go. Um, you know, there's certain, uh, I believe, like muscle stimulators where you um, put a couple probes on two muscles and you can uh, deliver a certain amount of current. And um, through an OSHA training that we went through, 
you know, we, we, we did this on certain parts of our body. I had one on a bicep and on forearm, and at about 20 milliamps, my fist was completely closed and I could not open it. And um, it's fair to say it was pain. It was definitely painful. You know, it was it was, it was painful and just a, a sensation that your body is not used to. Um, now, once you're past that 30 milliamp range, the 150 milliamp range, this is where um, death is possible. You know, um, most of our high pots of our high pot testers, you can get to the 30 to uh, 199.9 milliamp range. So again, it's really important to first understand and identify uh, the dangerous, you know, electrical shock opportunities in your workstation. Um, and then after that, train your operators on how to identify them and how to react to them. And then once you're, obviously, once you're in the amp range, then it's cardiac arrest, severe burns, and um, it's very unlikely people survive that. So let's talk about our human body, right? We're, we're pretty much a resistor. You know, you can say our the human body on average has about 1 to 1.5 kilo ohms resistance. You know, the outer layer of our skin provides the largest resistance, of course, and but all skin has a breakdown voltage in which it kind of becomes a punctured wire and leaving us exposed uh, so that what's left is the low resistance body tissue um, to impede the flow of current, which isn't going to impede it because our our nervous system, you know, our 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 blood delivery system, it's actually a great uh, conductor. It's a great way to deliver current. So if we think about this in just real world aspect, you know, um, let's say we're my body is a one kilo ohm resistor. If I'm exposed to just wall power, right, 120 volts, that's given me 120 milliamps of current flowing through my body from most likely if I'm touching an exposed, uh, exposed receptacle, you know, and that's going back through my body to ground, that's 120 uh, milliamps there, which puts me in the respiratory or rest phase, the, you know, ventricular fibrillation and um, the likelihood of death, you know, and obviously in Europe you can think about it as 220, 240, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, electricity is very dangerous and so it's important to kind of train our operators and that's just with wall power, so you know, um, you can imagine how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is uh, when high pot testing. So, moving on from there, um, quickly, before we got into um, deeper material, we wanted to ask uh, a quick poll question. Um, that poll question is, how many training hours do your operators receive before using test equipment? You know, what's kind of your protocol, your procedure? How, how does one consider an operator qualified? Um, because, you know, OSHA and um, the NEC along with the NFPA, um, you know, they have some thoughts on that and, and what they expect your operator to know before, um, you know, they're allowed to be considered qualified. And so we have a couple options of, you know, up to two hours, eight hours, you know, and so on and so forth. So Allison has probably opened that question for you guys. If you could uh, answer that for us, we can kind of use that feedback to see uh, where everyone sits on the training uh, time parameter. Hi, Tony. We've got kind of a shy audience today. Oh, it looks like a couple more votes are coming in. So far, we have received 33% of people receive up to two hours of training, and 75% of people receive up to eight hours of training. Thank everybody for participating. Okay, great. Um, so it sounds like, you know, within a day, um, your new employees or your operators or technicians are um, near a high pot tester, I'm sure, with um, a qualified trainer next to them. You know, if I can speak from my experience, I think 
you, I used to work at NRTL as a lab technician, and um, while being in the lab regularly, I think um, there's definitely weeks that go on before you're you're, you're allowed to, um, you know, use the equipment by yourself, and um, every company is different. So let's move on to. Actually, another point I wanted to bring up before we move on to uh, the 10 things to know uh, qualified test operators should know is um, another detail as visiting um, a poll question from last year was, you know, do you use ESD smocks in your uh, company or lab environment or test environment? And we had about 47% a, a of our um, web poll takers said that they do use ESD smocks. And so uh, I found that interesting. I think um, in the industry that we're in of high pot testing, you know, we understand that the ESD smock is important to protect very uh, sensitive equipment or components, I should say, you know, any type of static discharge um, on, a, on a small component could damage it. So those ESD smocks are there to kind of um, discharge the user, but in the high pot testing scenario, you know, you're kind of creating where you have a, a large potential difference, you know, if you're at the 1200, uh, 1200 volts, um, you're now kind of becoming the return or another return point or the ground, you're making your operator the ground, which can be uh, very dangerous, it is very dangerous, and um, so, as far as high pot testing, we really don't recommend any of the operators use ESD smocks. Um, it's just kind of not the right industry um, for those considerations. So, moving on to the qualified test operator, 10 things to know. So, some of these might be basic, but they're important, right? Determine if exposed conductor is energized, right? We have symbols on our instruments. Uh, caution, you know, if, if that high voltage light is blinking, then there is a live conductor somewhere on your station, right? Also, there's multiple ports in our instruments, so, and a lot, a lot of the ports, if you're outputting on one, you're also outputting on the other, so that's something to kind of think about when testing, although uh, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, there's if, you're, if you have a 1,240 volts coming out of the front, it's probably also coming out of the back, and not many people are aware of it. So it's kind of important to identify the caution signs and symbols and uh, lights that we've put on, but it's also important for you to understand how the equipment, equipment works, which kind of leads us into part two, right? Uh, know how to use the equipment and uh, read the specs. You know, what does that mean? That means you know, verify your input voltage. Verify where your output ports are, if there's more than one. You know, are they all active? <clears throat> um, also, using, a lot of people use, you know, secondary uh, probes, or maybe they had an old high pot tester and the cables fit. You know, it's important to check the specs of those accessories. You know, all of our accessories that we sell are rated to, um, greater than, you know, what our instruments can output. And so, you know, if you're doing, we have some instruments that can output 20 kV, you know, sometimes the probes that you're using might not be rated for that. And that's uh, when damage to your accessories can occur, which now leads to a dangerous uh, work environment. So it's kind of important to, you know, read the specs of your equipment as well as your accessories and just make sure that they're adequately insulated for the application you're using them for. Um, number three is understand approach distances and corresponding voltage. Um, like I said, AR instruments can output up, up to 20 kV AC-DC. Um, and talking specifically about OSHA standards, um, you know, not just where your power is coming from, but on instruments like this, where there's dang there's uh, dangerous, you know, electrical outputs, you kind of need to identify, um, you know, these different boundaries. 
um, a prohibited approach boundary, a restricted approach boundary, and a limited approach boundary. And these boundaries are not to be crossed by unqualified employees, right? So shock hazard exposure, these approach boundaries are referring to the electrical shock hazard and not the arc flash hazard. Um, an arc flash boundary may be greater or less than a shock boundary that depends on the equipment you're using and um, obviously the spacing and the surroundings. But talking about these boundaries, your limited approach boundary is entered by qualified persons or unqualified persons escorted by a qualified person. So on the next slide we'll get into how what do you define a qualified person and you know who who sets that. Um, your restricted approach boundary um, entered only by qualified persons required to use shock protection techniques and equipment. And then we go into the prohibited approach boundary, entered only by qualified persons requiring same protection as if in direct contact with live parts. So um, most of these um, requirements are kind of pulled directly from the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, and as well as NEC, right, the National Electric Code. Um, I believe in 2014, I believe that was the latest NEC code that came out, and uh, reading further in depth to those, you can find the exact type of PPE that is needed in specific boundaries as opposed uh, to other boundaries. So it's kind of important for every type of workstation that you have, you know, if you have three lines in a manufacturing plant where you're high pot testing, um, it's important to identify these boundaries, um, get training to qualify your operators, and to inform unqualified people that, hey, you're getting near um, an approach boundary, and if they're not qualified to be in that boundary, you at, least, you at least need to let them know what the hazards are. Okay, so what is qualified? So a qualified person is trained and knowledgeable in the construction and operation of equipment or specific work method. They're able to recognize and avoid electrical hazards and uh, may be qualified with respect to certain equipment and methods, but unqualified for others. So for a qualified person to work with limited approach boundaries, they must be trained to distinguish exposed energized parts from others, uh, determine nominal voltage, determine approach distances, and determine degree and extent of hazard and PPE required. All right, so that's what's considered a qualified person. And the onus actually, so OSHA doesn't give you an outline of like, hey, train them to these specific things um, for this amount of time and consider them qualified. It, the onus falls on the actual company where uh, the, the employer, I should say, when the employer feels comfortable calling you qualified, then you're qualified. But again, you know, that, that's a large responsibility. You don't want to just call anyone qualified because now you have quote unquote qualified people in um, high voltage dangerous areas where they might not know how to react to a situation or identify hazards. Um, so again, this is kind of specifically um, speaking to uh, the OSHA standard and uh, what they expect from employers when creating a safe work environment for their operators. Um, moving on to uh, the next of the 10 things to know, a qualified operator. Understand the relationship between electrical hazard and possible injury. Okay, so this makes sense, right? This just kind of falls into um, the previous statement of what we consider qualified. You know, you need to train your operators not to just It's a procedure. You know, I memorized how to run a test, um, but did I really know what was what was actually happening? You know, sure, I knew how to make I knew to make this connection here, this connection here, and press um, start button and look for a pass. But did I really understand 
um, the output potential of this instrument, where the actual potential difference was being dropped on to, how close was I to it, would I know if someone was walking near, hey, you're safe there, but stay away from this area. You know, these are the, these are the type of details that um, a trained and qualified operator should know, right? So that's understand the relationship between electrical hazard and possible injury. Um, next, know the safety features of the equipment and how to utilize, utilize them. I know we get, um, you know, a lot of questions on what smart GFI is. Uh, what makes it smart? How do we utilize it? Can we disable it? Why would I want to enable it or disable it? Um, questions about our interlock. You know, is it a hardware interlock, software interlock? Um, so our interlock is, um, for those who don't know, on our, on our signal input, we have um, a relay, you know, that's open until this interlock, these two pins are shorted, allowing output um, to output, you know, high voltage to output. If this interlock is broken, then the equipment will immediately shut off. So how can this interlock be broken? That's, um, you know, a DUT enclosure being opened. That is um, a palm switch being let go. You know, the interlock and PLC control in general of our signal input, it's, it's a very basic but powerful way to automate um, your test system and um, make it safe. Okay, our smart GFI, I, I didn't give a summary on that, but that's kind of, you know, if our, we know our instrument, our transformer knows how much current is being drawn, it expects that same current to return uh, to the transformer through our return port. Now, if there is a difference, if we're missing some current of about um, 0.5 milliamps, that will trigger our smart GFI um, and the output will immediately shut off. You know, so that's purely for operator safety. And then we have an automatic discharge circuit, right? That's another relay that will close after a test, um, a high pot test has, has completed, usually let's say a DC high pot, let's say you're testing a DC uh, high pot and you have a relatively highly capacitive product um, you know, it's going to take some time for that capacitive charge um, to be discharged, but what we do is, I believe it's a patented discharge circuit, um, we'll close a relay that shorts to the, our transformer, so using the impedance of our transformer, you are now uh, within 200 milliseconds, um, well, depending on what instrument you have, from 50 to 200 milliseconds, we guarantee your DUT to be discharged if the uh, capacitive specs of your DUT fall within our discharge specs. So this goes back to understanding the specs, reading them, reading uh, the manual, right? How much can this instrument discharge? You know, you don't want to put uh, something highly capacitive that's way above our spec um, our, I'm sorry, our capacitor specs for discharge because now you run into the chance of not only having a non-discharge DUT but attempting to discharge way more than that relay can handle and potentially damaging your high pot instrument. Okay, so that was four and five. Understand the relationship between electrical hazard and possible injury and know the safety features of the equipment and how to utilize them. Um, those safety features are usually the make or break deals on why someone will buy one instrument over the other. Uh, moving on, more of the 10 things your qualified test operator should know. Determine if PPE is necessary. Again, this goes back to kind of the OSHA requirements of what boundary are you in, what type of PPE is necessary, and making sure it's properly rated. You know, the, um, boots, uh, like grounding boots, or I'm sorry, isolation boots, um, HV gloves, um, those all have specs too, those all have ratings, so it's important to let your operator uh, know where to identify that, um, as well with eye protection and a helmet. Uh, so PPE is, you know, a major industry that is needed to 
make sure your operator is safe when near these hazardous situations. Um, we'll talk specifically about more PPE um, later in the presentation. Um, so from now we can go to number seven. Know the methods of release for victims who are being shocked. Obviously it's kind of our human nature to want to you know, pull someone off something when they're being shocked. Um, but all you're doing is now extending that circuit, right? Not only they're getting shocked, but now you've just become part of the of that circuit, and now you're getting shocked as well. So, something that I don't see as much as I would think, but you know, in in test stations, um, there should be some non-conductive um, poles, just in case um, you know an operator is shocked, to kind of help. Um, release them from that live circuit. Another option we have in this situation would be um, an e-stop, right? An emergency stop. Um, a lot of facilities I go to, you know, there's an e-stop not very far from each operator, just in case that e-stop will cut off um, any power to uh, either the whole bench or um, depending on how, you know, the employer wants it, either that entire test operating bench, the whole uh, test line, you know, so an e-stop is another great way to stop someone from being shocked. Um, eight, understand that the tester is a variable voltage power source. So obviously we're putting 120 volts into this high pot tester and now we can get up to 20k, right? And now it's understood that you're not, there's not a lot of current right, in our transformer. For, for stepping up all the way to 20K, there's not a lot of current that can be provided, but once you're at 20K, you have such a strong electric field that arcing is just so much um, more likely, the likelihood of arcing, uh, of corona buildup around the instrument or around your DUT. Um, it's why it's, it's going back to what I was saying, it's kind of important to understand what this tester is actually doing. You know, we're stepping up um, a voltage um, from 120 with infinite current to now um, up to 20,000 volts. And while someone feels safe around, you know, something you just plugged into the wall, you now have a potential difference of 20K, which not many of us are familiar with, but you know you'll probably corona buildup can occur. You'll hear a buzz, and it's just kind of a different environment that operators might not be used to when first starting to high pot test or um, a new application that's introduced. You know where now you're not you're no longer testing at 2 kV. You're now testing at 20 kV. So you know understand that the tester is a variable voltage power source. Contacting the DUT during the test can result in a dangerous shock hazard. Number nine, know the importance of discharging the DUT. So, again, I've stated we have we have a discharge circuit, right? We have a method of discharging the DUT as long as it falls within um, the capacitive specs. I believe our highest um, capacitive spec is like uh, either one microfarad or half a microfarad, depending on what your um, what instrument specifically you have and a voltage, right? Like, hey, if you're at half a microfarad, don't charge this DUT at higher than 1 kV. Don't test at higher than 1 kV. Otherwise, not only can we not guarantee the discharge within that 50 to 200 milliseconds, but now I can't guarantee that my relay can handle that type of discharge. You might cause some arcing or welding on that relay and now you've just damaged your instrument. So, this goes back to reading the specs and um, another method for discharging your DUT is obviously a, there's a lot of discharge sticks, right? Um, one end with um, a conductive path, another end is isolated, um, discharging that capacitive um, charge or any way to send that charge back to ground, you know, without the operator uh, being in between that circuit is is just uh, imperative to discharge your DUT. Obviously, we're speaking um, with uh, DC high pot testing. Um, another thing you do is uh, just increase your ramp down time. You know, increasing your ramp down time kind of controls that discharge um, 
as opposed to relying on just the, the discharge circuit, that relay. Um, if you step down your voltage through a ramp down, there will be less charge on your DUT. Um, there must be a complete path for an instrument to discharge. Be wary, all leads are connected um, for testing, right? So we're pretty much saying, hey, don't become the path of discharge, right? Just because the, the test is over doesn't mean now I can grab this DUT and put another one on there. You know, you need to verify that it's discharged. Um, and number 10 is kind of just a, a catch-all, right? Each step in a work plan must be executed. So they're pretty much saying each step in a, in a test procedure must be executed, right? Um, going to different uh, manufacturers and doing some consulting and training, we see, you know, they have specific test procedures that need to be foolproof, right? I need an operator to come here, read this, and have absolutely no confusion of how to run this test. And in those procedures, there should be um, warnings of, you know, where the dangers lie, how to properly discharge your DUT, and pretty much providing that operator with a safe work environment is the responsibility that the employer has. And do not take shortcuts. You know, there's, um, it's easy to create your test procedure that tells you everything to properly do to make sure the DUT and the operator stay safe, but, you know, on top of that training of the operator to make sure they're not taking shortcuts, to make sure they're not getting lazy and skipping steps or think they have everything memorized. Um, so, you know, in an industry of high pot testing where even uh, people like myself who um, give webinars on, uh, you know, safe test stations, we still get shocked to this day in our lab. Um, you know, so it's just, it's, it's unpredictable and you kind of need to take um, all the proper procedures um, to make sure you avoid those situations and if those situations occur, the training on how to react to that. Um, so building safeguards into a station, right? We have um, a DUT enclosure, which you can see on top. It's uh, designated to remove all shock hazards. So how does it do that? So we put our DUT um, assuming it can fit in, you know, our DUT enclosure. We put that DUT inside the enclosure. We've now routed our high voltage and return leads through the back, and we've connected this DUT enclosure to the interlock of our instrument. So again, what's the interlock, right? If that's shorted, I will allow high voltage output. If it's open, um, no output will occur, meaning my operator is opening this DUT enclosure, there's no way output can occur on my instrument, right? He's placing the DUT in, DUT enclosure is still open, making his connections, has now closed the DUT enclosure. Only in this state can our Omnia, for example, you know, output high current or high voltage. So it's just a very simple way to eliminate um, the possibility of shock, you know? without, you know, excluding, you know, user error or just, you know, being irresponsible. Um, cabling and insulation. And so, like I said before, all the accessories and probes that we provide, uh, we understand the type of um, output that comes from our instruments. And so we make sure that the insulation of those probes and test leads are more than adequate to handle the output that our instruments uh, cannot can give, right, 20 kV or 60 amps, you know, on a ground bond test. It's important to, when purchasing, purchasing your probes, you know, ideally from the manufacturer, if you're not buying from the manufacturer, then the onus falls on you to make sure that the ratings fit for your application. Um, using PPE, you know, personal protective equipment, um, whether it be steel toe boots, or uh, isolation boots um, to make sure that your operator is never on ground. These are, or an isolation mat, right? These are um, safeguards to make sure you've identified certain situations where shock can occur. Now I've implemented either PPE or other safeguards to eliminate those. 
Um, and then for those unqualified um, employees, right, who are just passing by, walking through, taking a shortcut, you need to let them know you're entering a hazardous area, right? And they should be trained to know if I see the sign, I know what that means, right? Do I know how to use the equipment? Do I know if someone gets shocked? Um, how do I help them? No, but they can identify, hey, I'm entering uh, a hazardous area and I know what that means, right? Um, so, for example, here's a test. Here's a test area, right? Um, we're going to talk about methods of safety testing. This is safety testing with positive protection. Positive protection meaning I have a DUT enclosure, meaning I'm positive that my operator will be nowhere near high voltage or high current when he hits that test button, because the DUT enclosure is isolating that from the operator, and if that operator attempts to get close, close and opens uh, the DUT enclosure, I'll put shut off. And here we see the 10-foot boundary that OSHA calls out for, for people not qualified and trained to use these instruments. If you're not qualified and trained to use these instruments, you cannot be um, within 10 feet of it. Right, so now we have, um, you know, some people assembling the DUT, and then we have our trained operator with positive protection, um, with the DUT enclosure. He has his uh, insulation mats. So what's that mean? He's isolated from ground, right? And um, you can see he has a um, a tower light, right? Meaning the unqualified assemblers will know, although they don't know how to use this equipment, although they don't know exactly what to do if this guy's shocked, they know when this light is on, hey, it's now a hazardous uh, environment or situation, right? And again, we have our e-stop switch um, for, you know, if something were to occur where, um, let's say this guy touches uh, the input power to the iPod tester. You know, and he's getting shocked. Someone can um, use the e-stop switch or button to stop all output. And then again, another method of letting unqualified employees know, hey, you're entering a potentially uh, dangerous high voltage area. And now, sometimes applications call out for this these types of links because you just can't provide positive protection, right? If I'm testing a refrigerator or, um, you know, a washing machine or, you know, a huge motor, um, I just can't, I can't have a DUT enclosure. I can't have positive protection. I can't, it's just not feasible to constantly be picking up, um, you know, this motor and putting in a new motor into this DUT enclosure. And so now <clears throat> we have our test station with no positive protection, but you've created a boundary, right, a boundary path where no one can come close, not even by accident, into this hazardous test area. So you can see we have our, we, we've gated off um, the test station. We have our high voltage signs um, accordingly. Again, we still have our e-stop switch and tower lights. And so, I guess the only thing I see with this operator is he's still on an insulation mat, right? So he is exposed, or he's he's isolated from ground. So let's say this washing machine is live, right? And he puts he puts his one hand on it, one hand to the side. He's safe, right? He's safe. But if that other hand were to touch um, this high pot machine, which which may be grounded, now you've just created that path through your chest cavity. So um, high voltage gloves um, would be a possibility in this situation. Um, just you know, any means to make sure uh, you're covering all your bases in different types of scenarios where a shock can occur. Okay, so we're on to our second poll question. Um, speaking of, what PPE accessories do you utilize in your workstation? 
and um, there's a couple multiple choices and insulation mat which again isolates you from ground right if you're standing on it you're pretty much an open you're an open wire unless your two hands have completed a circuit somewhere else which now if you had gloves on then you're completely safe but again um, we've taken that into consideration right we have touchscreen instruments um, so what's my operator going to do consistently take his glove on and off well we also have um, so we've considered that and we've made um, you know my menu keys where you can use a glove and still operate the instrument um, a warning sign. So we know what a warning sign does. It, it alerts unqualified personnel that you're entering a dangerous, hazardous area. Signal tower light lets lets you know a test is um, a device is under test or the test is just completed. A dual palm switch, uh, DT enclosure e stop, and the uh, dual remote palm switch, same as a dual palm switch. We'll we'll talk about those in. A little bit later in the slide, um, specifically, uh, but for now, let's see if Allison has our results, or we'll wait for um, some late submissions here to the poll. We do indeed have results, Anthony. Thank you, everybody, for voting. So our results today are going to be over a hundred percent because we recommended that everyone choose all that apply. Um, Seventy-five percent of people are using warning signs. Seventy-five percent of people are incorporating insulation mats. Twenty-five percent of today's visitors are using DUT enclosures, 25% are using signal tower lights, and 50% are using e-stops. Thank you guys for your participation. Great, so um, obviously 75% are using warning signs. Um, we want to alert, you know, the unqualified work, 75% um, are 25% are using the DUT enclosure. Um, let me fix my slides here really quick. Great. Um, so that's that's good to hear. You know, you're providing 25% um, of, of our viewers are providing that positive protection. The other 25 just, just might not be feasible with your DUTs or how your um, test station is set up, right? So here we have, a, we'll, we'll have some videos later, but here's just kind of an, another real world AR test station with positive protection, right? This is um, one of our DUT enclosures, um, which again will connect to the interlock of our Omnia. We have our high voltage danger sign, and so, you know, if a salesperson were to walk into this lab, they kind of understand what's going on. So this is positive protection though, right? It doesn't really, <clears throat> do I need a signal tower light to let them know? Not really, because I have my DUT enclosure. If that's closed or if that's open, um, there's no way, if it's open, there's no way that this DUT will ever become live, right? Now, here's our test station without positive protection. Um, we have our DUT exposed, um, but we're now using the dual remote palm switch, right? So what's that mean? That means if you want to run this test, you have to press both these buttons within half a second and hold it down for the duration of your dual cycle, your ramp down cycle, um, ramp up, what have you, you know? Because if you let go, you're going to abort the test and you're going to need to start over. So what's that do? That occupies your operator's hands verifying that they'll, they'll never be on the DUT or anywhere near the DUT, right? And so obviously um, we recommend um, a specific uh, separation area of these so, you know, a lazy operator can't just use one arm to trigger them and what have you. And so we're just kind of trying to foolproof our test station, right? Make sure there's no way that our operator will get anywhere near um, the high voltage instrument or the device under test. Um, again, a little more details on our dual remote palm switch. So it does not allow the operator to touch the DUT as their hands must remain on the test switch during the test. And again, you're going to need about uh, half a second. If that's not pressed within half a second, test won't start and for those who do who have purchased our dual palm remote switch um, or are interested in it you know 
obviously this is using PLC control, so your PLC remote must be on, and a feature um, on our HyPod Ultras, which is kind of our, our most popular instrument at the current time, you know, under the user interface, you need to activate the dual test parameter on to have these work properly. If that's not on, then they're kind of going to work, they're not going to work as intended, you know, so it's just, uh, you'll, you, you see that in the instructions though, but uh, just uh, that everyone's aware. Um, some more additional methods for operator safety is our signal lights. Mounted lights warn operators in the nearby area to the status of the HyPod test. Hey, if it's green, um, the test has just passed. You're good to walk by. If it's red, hey, this device is under test. Don't walk by. Okay, we have our additional methods for operator safety. Um, here we have uh, Bashan Patel, our other applications engineer, standing on the uh, insulation mat as safe as can be, right? Uh, isolates the operator from ground while testing, which greatly mitigates shock hazards. It doesn't completely uh, eliminate shock hazards because if Bashan were to happen to be touching a grounded top of an instrument and a live, another live instrument, he's going to get shocked, you know. Um, let's look at some videos of just how that, oh, of course. So, here you can see Nick using a positive protection, right? He's got a tower light and a DUT enclosure. We kind of just quickly set this up to show you how it works with the PLC control. Um, there's no need to, s let's see, he's showing that's the connection in the back, right? The interlock to the signal in of the Omnia, he's going to run a test. He's going to open the DUT enclosure and immediately get an abort, right? You just aborted the test. Uh, interlock was open. So if that operator were to ever attempt to uh, touch the DUT while testing, um, output will shut off and there's no hazardous uh, situation. Um, and again, I'm not sure if we saw the tower light. Looks like it's red now, so we configured it in a different way. You can obviously configure it as desired. Um, he is using, okay, so we're not gonna be able to see what happens to the signal tower light. So now let's go to one without positive protection. So we're, here we're using um, a kind of an early edition of our dual remote pump switches. Um, they look a little different now, but obviously separated distance-wise to where an operator needs to use both hands. Um, you can see Nick, he's going to he's gonna try to hit test from the front, which he can't, right, because his PLC remote is on. So you need to use your dual remote pump switches. He starts the test, lets go, and gets the abort signal, right? because you're not going to be able to complete this test unless you're constantly holding down the dual remote palm switches for the duration of the test. There you get a pass and output is over. Operator can now use his hand safely without coming into contact with the DUT, with a live DUT. Um, I want to, I know we're doing actually pretty good on time. So. Here are some of the training resources. I'd like everyone to kind of reach out to Allison if, if you feel you need a um, copy of this webinar. We also, again, um, have taken some OSHA training, so we provide consulting on, uh, you know, creating a safe workstation or just setting up your test parameters, identifying what type of tests you need to do. Um, here are some links to uh, OSHA, the NFPA, and um, some other, the BSI, some other um, standards on the erection and operation of electrical test equipment. Um, unless there, I don't know if Syed got any good questions worth speaking to, maybe you can chime in. If not, this was uh, the last webinar of the year. Um, the year, you know, flew by, so we appreciate everyone who attended all of our webinars this year. Um, we hope you join us next year. We'll we, every year we try to attempt to uh, 
refresh our material and maybe bring up new topics. If you have any topic ideas or something that we haven't covered, please feel free to suggest that to us. Um, and other than that, um, here's Allison's email, our website, you know, you can uh, find us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, YouTube, um, doesn't sound like there's any questions, so um, we'll conclude this webinar, we'll wish everyone, uh, you know, happy Thanksgiving and holidays, New Year, we'll see you next year when our webinar series for 2017 crazy begins, okay, thank you for attending.